Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this event marking World Press Freedom Day 2023. This year is a, the 30th anniversary of World Press Freedom Day. Really worth marking. Thank you for coming. The event is part of the Nobel Peace Center series Nobel Peace Talks with topics related to the Nobel Peace Prize 2022, which was awarded to the Russian uh, human rights organization Memorial, to the Ukrainian Center for Civil Liberties, and to the Belarusian human rights activist Alice Bialyatsky. And today we're going to talk about press freedom in Russia and Belarus. My name is Ingvild Bryn Rambøl. I work at the Nobel Peace Center and I will be your host today. This event is in cooperation with the US Embassy and the Czech Embassy. And we also thank the University of Oslo for making us uh, uh, use this space here at Dumas Biblioteca while our uh, house is under refurbishment. Thank you very much for that. And thank you also to Reitan, Hydro and Fritur for making the event series possible. First, I want to give the floor to the director of the Nobel Peace Center, Kersti Flygstad. Thank you, Ingvild. Dear Excellencies, uh, dear guests, dear friends, happy World Press Freedom Day. Uh, or perhaps it's not so happy exactly this year. But this year marks, as Ingvild said, the 30th anniversary of the United Nations declaring 3rd of May as the World Press Freedom Day. A day to celebrate the importance of press freedom, a day to support champions of press freedom where they are threatened, and a day to pay tribute to journalists who have lost their lives on duty. For us at the Nobel Peace Center, World Press Freedom Day is an important day. Without press freedom, we cannot have human rights, democracy, and we cannot have peace. A free press is a fundamental aspect of a healthy civil society and a well-functioning democracy. As Dmitry Muratov, one of the Peace Prize laureates, from 2021 stated, journalism serves as the antidote to tyranny. Press freedom provides journalists with the opportunity to expose corruption, abuse of power, and other injustices, and helps to highlight important social issues and engage people in debates that can lead to change. A free press, open dialogue, and independent journalists are essential to driving society forward, and to maintain democracy, stability, and peace. Throughout the history, the Nobel Peace Prize ha have been given to many uh, journalists. One of them is the German editor, Karl von Ossietzky, who received the prize for, uh, for 1935, he received it in 1936, for his brave defense of freedom of speech. He used open sources and traditional journalistic methods. And Osiewski had revealed that the German government had built up a secret air force in violation of the peace treaty after World War I. His independent journalism was a threat to the Nazi regime, and this costs him his freedom first, and then finally it costs him his life. He was one of the first prisoners to be sent to a concentration camp by the Nazi regime, and he died in prison in 1938. Tabakul Karman is another example, the Yemeni human rights activist and one of the leading fig figures of the Arab Spring in Yemen, a journalist calling for democracy and freedom of speech in her home country. And last year, the Norwegian Nobel Committee highlighted the importance of press freedom for democracy and peace when they awarded the Peace Prize to Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov for their efforts to safeguard freedom of expression in the Philippines and Russia. And just as freedom of pr the press was highlighted as the foundation for peace and democracy in 2021, the Nobel Committee chose to highlight civil society and human rights activists in 2022. As Ingrid said, Memorial from Russia, Center for Civil Liberties from Ukraine, and Alice Bialetsky from Belarus are all human rights activists 
awarded the Peace Prize for the fight to promote the right to criticize power and protect the fundamental rights of citizens. The Russian war against Ukraine has made their work more difficult, much more dangerous, and even more important. Alas Bialetsky is one of more than 2,000 political prisoners in Belarus. Many of them are journalists who have criticized Lukashenko's regime. And in Russia, the human rights organization Memorial is banned and has been labeled as foreign agent by the Russian Supreme Court. Its members are being pr prosecuted by the states accused for discrediting the army or of extremist activities. But neither Alice, his organization Vyasna, or Memorial are giving up. They continue their work despite the authorities' efforts to stop them. The same is the case with most independent media in Russia and Belarus. They continue their work from exile. Since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, most independent journalists have fled Russia and Belarus. Two of them are here with us today, risking their own and their families' safety. As they continue to provide the people of their home countries with trustworthy, independent journalism. The world needs an antidote to tyranny. Lola Togava and Alessandra Pustkina, we are so grateful to have you here with us to mark this day. And I am looking very much forward to hearing your stories. A warm welcome also to Jamie Fly, uh, President and CEO of Radio Free Europe, the radio and media station that has served as a voice for independent news in Europe for more than 70 years. At last, I will thank the Czech and the US embassies uh, for making this event happen. Now, give a, give a warm welcome to Ambassador Mark Nathanson. The floor is yours. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today. It's a real privilege because this topic is very close to my heart. I was in the media business uh, for 45 years and an early investor with Ted Turner in CNN. We had doubts that it would ever take off, uh, but it did. Uh, I went into government under President Clinton where uh, he appointed me as chairman, the first chairman of the United States Agency for Global uh, media. When it became an independent agency, uh, I ran it for both President Clinton and Bush. I am deeply moved and still am deeply moved by the work that Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty have done. I had the pleasure of visiting uh, them many times uh, when I was ahead of then called the BBG. Uh, and I really remember clearly negotiating in Lithuania so we could broadcast uh, into Belar Belarus. Uh, I proudly worked alongside Bill Clinton and Madeleine Albright to secure the release back then of RFE RL reporter Andrei Babinski from a Russian jail. Now we must do it all over again. The unlawful imprisonment of not just Evan Gershkovitz but also 363 other journalists who are in prison in 30 countries around the world must be freed. I would like to thank our co-host, the Embassy of the Czech Republic, and especially my friend, David Chervinka, and the Nobel Peace Center for making this event possible and supporting free press around the world. Just yesterday, Secretary of State Tony Blinken praised the Czech leadership on human rights, democracy, and civil society issues. He thanked the Czech Republic for hosting Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty in Prague since 1995. I'm proud to have participated in, in those negotiations with the Czech government. It is a pleasure and honor to have Jamie Fry here in Oslo to speak to us today. I commend the Nobel Peace Center for their continued support and the brave defenders of global human freedom. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you for uh, framing the discussion for us, and thank you for your commitment to press freedom. Uh, okay, we've heard about him already, and I think it's about to, to welcome the first uh, panelist uh, on stage, Jamie Fly, CEO and President of Radio Free Europe. Please, take the stage. Welcome. Great to be with you. It's good to have you here on this important day. Um, let's go back in history a little bit first. Radio Free Europe was founded in the 50s. It was founded as the Western world's voice in Eastern Europe to, to provide people with, behind the Iron Curtain with, uh, with news from, from the free world. So how, how has your role changed over the years? Well, uh, great to be with you, and, and thanks to the, the Nobel uh, Prize Center for hosting uh, this discussion, as well as the U.S. Embassy and uh, the Czech Embassy. So the interesting thing, actually, I think about our work is it hasn't really changed all that much at, at its core. Um, we're still trying to do local reporting to provide people with news and information in societies where uh, they don't have a lot of other sources of information. Back during that period, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, what we often faced was uh, state propaganda outlets in those countries who were the primary source of information that the public, if they wanted to know what was going on, they would tune in to some sort of government-controlled broadcaster in their country. Uh, that was a pretty easy market for us because once we developed a brand that was independent, people knew that they could come to us and we were the alternative. Uh, we're still doing that sort of reporting today in a lot of the same countries, unfortunately, where we haven't seen progress or now we've seen backsliding. The challenge we face today is actually audiences are usually bombarded with all kinds of different information. And you even see this in, in a place uh, like Russia, uh, where there are options. People do have choice, and it's an illusion of choice of independent uh, thought and of independent uh, information. The reality is a lot of those different options that are presented to people are still controlled by the government or they're controlled by actors who have an agenda that they're trying to advance, uh, sometimes a domestic agenda. And so our role is to be there, to be that trusted voice, uh, to break through all of that chaos in the media landscape and make sure that if people truly want to seek out independent information that they can come to us. And the challenge we have today is really in distribution, whereas during the Cold War we could broadcast through transmitters like the one the ambassador mentioned uh, and reach almost every household. Today, that's a little bit harder because governments, unfortunately, are able to control internet access, control what websites people can see. Uh, and so a lot of our uh, challenge today is making sure that we stay one step ahead of those regimes and we can still get that independent information into people's hands uh, if they want to use it. Yeah, because you, you've had to close down your offices, haven't you, in, in Russia and, and Belarus? So how do, you, how do you reach audiences there now? Yeah, doing the on-the-ground journalism that we got accustomed to over the last several decades after the events of 89 and 91 is increasingly difficult, not just in Russia and Belarus, um, but everywhere across Eurasia where we operate. Governments are much more willing to kick journalists out, to imprison them, uh, to designate them things like foreign agents or extremists in the Belarus, uh, in the Lukashenko regime's terminology. Um, we can still do reporting from outside. You can use technology to engage with your audience for them to share information. Uh, you just think everyone's carrying around cell phones. Those are information gathering devices. Audience members can take video. They can share it with editors who work on the outside who can then take that video, verify it, do other reporting, make it useful, put it into a report. So we're doing that sort of journalism from outside the country. On the distribution side, the key issue is finding technological means to deal with this government blocking of websites uh, or the government surveillance of the audience, which I think we're seeing an extreme version of in Belarus, where even the accounts that people follow can get them in trouble, where if they click and like a piece, a piece of mm -hmm. content or share it, it can lead to some sort of punishment from the government. And there, we need to uh, come up with new technological tools to provide secure means of communication with the audience to make sure that they can still engage with our content in a safe manner. And we deploy a lot of those tools in Russia and Belarus, but some of those are yet to be developed, and some we need to uh, put more investment and energy into as the regime censorship gets worse and worse. 
Do you think that the founding, founding fathers back then would, uh, would have believed that the need for Radio Free Europe would still be here 70 years after? I, 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 I believe they probably had uh, assumed it would not be necessary, and even, and Ambassador Nathanson could probably talk about this, even when we moved to Prague uh, in the 90s, there was a debate in the US about whether Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty was even needed at that point, mm. uh, after the events of 89 and 91, and some advocated for shutting us down because they thought that independent media would flourish across the region, uh, would take hold in all of these societies, um, and we were able to close a number of our operations and shut down some of our offices. Um, but sadly, in recent years, even before the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, we've actually been pulled back into old markets and we actually returned to three EU member states, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, in part because of uh, backsliding on press freedom, mm -hmm. because of increased government control over the media. And so everywhere we look across Eurasia, we see the trends headed in the wrong uh, direction uh, with a closing space for independent media and more pressure against journalists. So your mission is to, to spot uh, the countries where press freedom is really threatened and under pressure and, and go in there and, and serve the people with, uh, with information. Yeah, ideally we're only operating in the toughest cases and the problem is there are more and more of those countries mm -hmm. uh, where press freedom is under assault. Uh, and uh, now the fact that we're back in democracies, um, that's a really troubling sign, I think, about how this is not just a problem related to authoritarian regimes and the worst actors like Russia and Belarus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the new uh, press freedom index was launched uh, this morning, and there are a lot of red uh, alert countries on, on that map. Mm -hmm. How do you see, how does that affect your work? No, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's good in the, for us in the sense that we're expanding and growing, and there's a lot of work. Uh, it's sad, though, because ideally we would like to be able to uh, move out of some of these countries and stop our work because we want to leave behind flourishing media markets uh, that have independent actors that are not reliant on an international public broadcaster uh, like ourselves. But that's not the reality of the world we're living in. Right now, and if you look down the road at some of the technological developments, a lot of talk about artificial intelligence in recent months, there's a real danger that I think some of these trends could become much worse in the years to come uh, as there are more technological tools at the disposal of regimes who want to control information and want to really disguise the information they're providing and make it seem more independent than it truly is. And so I think that's something we're gonna need to watch as well. You said earlier that, that you had to be ahead of uh, the governments who wants to, to control uh, their country's media. How, how easy is, to, is it to be ahead? Well, I think uh, it, it depends on the exact situation and which country you're talking about. I think we've had a lot of success in Russia uh, over the last year since the full-scale invasion, um, in, in part because you can try as a government to block access to independent information, but there's something in human nature that uh, pushes people to seek out information. People want the facts. People have a sense, even if they're not very political, about when their government is lying to them, when they're not getting told the full story. And we certainly have seen that play out from the Russian audience uh, over the last 14, 15 months. Uh, we've had record levels of Russian audience coming to our content, and that's despite the fact that our websites were blocked one week into the full-scale invasion. Uh, that's despite the fact that we're labeled a foreign agent. That's despite the fact that we've had to move many of our journalists outside of Russia, so we're not able to do as much on-the-ground reporting. Uh, and we've had Russian audiences coming to our reporting about Ukraine, even seeking out that reporting in other languages when they realize that they're not getting told the truth about what's happening inside Ukraine, what the fate of their loved ones are who are being sent to the front lines. Uh, so that heartens us in the sense that people are still interested in independent information and they're skeptical when they're being lied to by their governments. And I think that's something we see across our coverage region. And so then it's just making sure that we keep open lines of communication and that there are ways using virtual private networks or different websites where we can still put our content in front of them uh, even when the government is trying to impose more and more restrictions to block that information. So practically, when, when your website is uh, 
is blocked? What do you do? We started actually uh, about a year prior to the full-scale invasion putting out videos in Russian to our audience about how to circumvent blocking, in part because we thought we were going to get blocked at that point by the Kremlin due to a long-running legal battle we had with them. So we tried to educate our audience about using virtual private networks, VPNs. Here's how you download one. Here's how you turn it on. Here's how you use it to get independent information. We also then obviously advertise the other platforms that are not blocked uh, currently, YouTube, Telegram, where we can still reach people. And so just informing the audience about the fact that they might need to change their uh, online habits to accommodate the new reality. So there's a lot of extra work beyond just the good journalism that has to then go into producing news and information for audiences in a closing environment like that. But it's something, unfortunately, we've dealt with many times over our 70 years of history. Back during the Cold War, peop uh, the Soviets, other governments were jamming our signals, and I still meet uh, people uh, who grew up during that period, who remember huddling around the radio with their family members, having to change the frequency on the broadcast every night to a different frequency mm. because of the jamming. And so it was a modern form of a VPN, essentially, or it was an old form of, of what is now a modern VPN uh, to get around that sort of blocking. And so it just requires that conversation with the audience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we talked about Russia and Belarus and the situation for journalists there already. So I think it's about time to welcome uh, our two other panelists uh, for today's uh, discussion. Um, we have uh, Lola Tarayeva with us. She's founder and editor-in-chief uh, at uh, Vertska, an independent Russian publication. Hello, welcome, and congratulations. Vertska was one year old last yes. week. Yes. <laughs> And also welcome to Alexandra Pushkina, and I'm allowed to call her Sasha, <laughs> <laughs> who is director of communication at Serkala. Serkala used to be uh, known as Tutbai, the largest uh, news provider in Belarus uh, earlier. Before we talk anymore, I think we should give them a warm applause. Thank you for being here. So, uh, Sasha, yeah. uh, you work in, you used to work in Tutbai, which was uh, the largest news provider in Belarus, uh, the largest independent one. Uh, but then in May 2021, something happened. Yeah, something wrong. Something uh, wrong. Firstly, uh, I want to say thank you for your invitation and uh, your support. It's very important for us now. Uh, and yes, uh, I want to tell you uh, our story about Tutbai. Uh, Tutbai worked uh, in Belarus uh, more than 20 years. And uh, every third uh, people reads us in Belarus. Uh, people in Belarus trust us. Uh, and when uh, Authorities destroyed us. Uh, our employee uh, must uh, went abroad. But firstly, uh, I want to say that authorities destroyed Dubai and detained my colleagues, 15 my colleagues, uh, including editor-in-chief Marina Zolotova and CEO Ludmila Chekina. Uh, now this perfect woman uh, have a sentence, 12 years, for each, and listed in terroristic list. Uh, the must of uh, employees went to Ukraine and launched uh, new media, Zerkala IO, and now we have more than three million unique users per month. Uh, and at the same time, uh, in Belarus, live nine million people. I think it's a great result. Uh, we are blocked in Belarus at the first hour working day and at the first day of this uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, we have extremist status in Belarus, but uh, we have a new way to find our audience. 
but it's very hard work. Uh, maybe harder than when we work in Belarus at the protests. But when we uh, worked at the protests, uh, we didn't know about we come home today or not. Uh, it's very unusual. Uh, but I think uh, at the Belarus we have more than uh, three um, uh, percent of uh, mistake uh, because uh, we make doing a fact check. Uh, but now we have maybe near one percent of mistake and it's really too great result for us. Uh, because propaganda uh, working good, Russian and Belarusian propaganda. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, you, you told me um, you told me earlier that um, you were part of the protests, and then you were um, you were working as a street journalist then, but now you are. You're one of two spokespersons at Circula. Why is it so that you are the only ones who are showing your face? Uh, it's a difficult question for me because uh, it's the first day of uh, Circula. Uh, I must uh, write in the press release, uh, release mm -hmm. uh, and need um, a spokesperson. But uh, our top management was detained, and uh, we didn't uh, we didn't know uh, who that person who must uh, tell about our case. I was a PR manager at uh, Tutbai, and it's my work. And I say, okay, I do it. Uh, but it's very dangerous for my family because my parents now live in Belarus, uh, but it's my choice now, uh, because I must do that. Uh, it's something about freedom of speech. <laughs> uh, it sounds like a joke uh, in Belarus now, <laughs> but um, I think it's very important to tell our story, because it's uh, a very famous and very big media in Belarus. And uh, we have a power because uh, we uh, always have a solution for people. Uh, how do something in uh, this dictatorship country? Uh, and one day and authorities destroyed us. And I think it's very important to tell our story, to tell about our prisoners, uh, more than 30 journalists now imprisoned in Belarus. Mm. And yes, I'm a spokesperson from Zerka, and my English is not very good, but I'm trying, and more than one year I am uh, learn this language uh, that I want to tell uh, about independent media in Belarus. Thank you so much for being here and for being the voice of uh, Zerkula. Thank you. We appreciate it very much. Lola Tagayeva, you used to be a news journalist in Russia before. And then uh, you took a break, you did something else. Yes. And then the war broke out. How did that change your plans? Uh, yes, we have a pretty different story than Zerko or Tutbai. Because Vorska exists one year, in April was uh, one year. And we also exist because of war, because mm -hmm. uh, mm, yes, I made a, a break, and before uh, I was a political journalist. I was editor of a political department. I was managing uh, editor of Russian independent media like Novaya Gazeta, uh, TV Rain, and uh, other projects. So, and uh, one moment I started to make a. a to make a break and uh, to make another project about the gender issues. I'm a founder of the Russian uh, f um, festivals about the gender issues. So, and uh, the war, when the war started, um, I think everyone was shocked. 
and I was shocked uh, like one month, and after one month I decided I have to come back. Because uh, I have to come back, because I, I saw that the media where I worked before, I mean, the TV rain, the Norway Gazette was uh, blocked, they were destroyed in the, that moment. And I understood that I have to work. Uh, that I understood that every journalist in this moment has a choice. We have to, um, we have to fight. We have to fight, and everyone um, has to fight. Because I mean, when I'm saying fight, I'm, I'm, I mean that fight against the propaganda, first of all. And we have to provide independent information as much as we can. One journalist is okay, is 100 is, is better. But um, when I saw that the media destroyed, and I decided, okay, we have to work. How much people I can, I can find? And it was just three journalists and me. Mm -hmm. Now we have 25 after one year. And now Verska is one of the most uh, noticeable um, media and uh, one of the Mm, pretty, mm, how to say it, pretty brave investigative <laughs> outlet. Uh, and we decided to start to work and make what we can. And now we have a political department, we have department about the storytelling, and we're trying to provide the, uh, that, uh, the independent uh, information for, for Russians. And first of all, we're trying to cover the kind of um, points which are, of course, hidden, because pr how propaganda works, they're trying to, you know, to don't speak about the real issues mm -hmm. which uh, Russians are forced to, and about the real problems and about the crimes in the Ukraine. And our job, for, of course, to find this case, to investigate and to provide. And Verska works like an uh, investigative outlet. So, um, we provide the information, and usually we work in this way. We provide the information and other media uh, to republish it. Mm. You're based in Prague. Yes. And uh, most of your colleagues, they're not in, in, in Russia anymore. How do, you, how do you get information from inside Russia? Some of our colleagues are still in Russia. And uh, we have reporters. Uh, from Russia, and uh, we have still insiders in Russia. Mm. Um, and uh, when you work, for example, with Russian regions, all you need is uh, your phone and correct number to whom you can call and ask, hmm, tell me please, what's going on? Mm. And you have information. And now, um, of course, when you have a possibility to go and see by your eyes what's going on, it's better for journalism. But in, in this case, when you have this kind of a huge propaganda, every uh, um, truth, every the tr uh, true information is important. Mm. And so it doesn't matter maybe this um, kind of, I mean, the reporting with photos, with videos. Uh, first of all, is it true? What, what do you need? I remember when we started, I mean, the worst when, when we started, um, the first day, the story was such important, uh, and we didn't have, uh, we didn't prepare everything in a proper way. But the, the story was such important that I said, okay, Frankly speaking, we can write it by, by our hands on the paper, make a photo, and I can post on my Facebook, and everyone will read. Because the story is most important, that the way sometimes how you provide it. This is my opinion. And, and people want to read your stories. Uh, they want access to yeah, they, they a want different to, type uh, of story. People want uh, just people who want information. They need everything. They need the TV shows. They need. Telegram channels, the short posts, the long uh, reads, everything depends on the depends on the case. How how do you keep your sources safe? I mean, we we hear that uh, journalists are being uh, imprisoned both in Russia and in Belarus. How do you make sure that your sources are safe? 
I don't feel safe. For if I'm speaking about myself, if I speak about my journalists, I'm, I'm trying to cover the names who works inside the Russia. Uh, I don't. I'm trying to not mm, to mm, even don't say to my friends, to my family, with whom I work, because mm. um, I don't know. Um, and uh, we're trying to use uh, some safe messengers uh, to delete all. Uh, sensitive information. We work thinking that we always um, have some kind of eyes who look at us mm. every moment. But I think that Sasha will will know about it a little bit <laughs> more because they mm. we work one year in, in this uh, uh, under this pressure. They work l much more. Uh, yeah, uh, we work in anonymously, but I think uh, we thinking about uh, save uh, of our uh, readers and subscribers and uh, our speakers uh, who tell some story uh, for us. Um, for example, we use the blog, uh, which not uh, not recognized uh, like extremist uh, blog and uh, reposting the materials from this blog, or uh, we uh, take the information from uh, social media of our speakers. Uh, and it's very hard work uh, for journalists because you do that, but you don't know uh, what's thinking about it, uh, the authorities. Because uh, we know about some cases when uh, authorities uh, open the case um, um, to our readers, that uh, these people uh, have a subscription of Zerkula. Yeah, because it's illegal just to yes. read yes. Zerkula. It's illegal to have your application on the mm -hmm. phone. Yeah, because we have a, a status of extremist in Belarus. Mm. So what is the punishment for reading extremist material? If I, if I was in uh, Belarus and I read your articles on my phone, what would I risk? Mm, maybe uh, you will have um, criminal, uh, not criminal uh, articles, administrative articles. Uh, but when you sharing our articles, mm. uh, maybe you will have a criminal case. And how many years in prison could, would I risk if I shared an article? I, I don't know, because maybe only Vesna um, may know uh, this situation. Mm. Uh, we know only one or two case, but uh, we don't know it's Zerkala or another independent media because uh, in the uh, case writing only extremist media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So w what about um, the people who are working for Radio Free Europe? Uh, how, how, what do you do to keep your sources and your journalists uh, safe in this environment? So for our journalists, um, this has meant uh, as with uh, Sasha and Lola, a, a lot of moving. I mean, journalists have had to flee Russia, Belarus. Um, some of them have had to move several times because similarly, I think to Sasha, what Sasha recounted, um, some of our Belarusians initially went to Kyiv. Uh, then Kyiv was the target of, of the full-scale invasion and they had to move again. So we're very appreciative to the Latvian and Lithuanian governments who have helped us set up offices in Riga and Vilnius, where we're now doing a lot of our journalism for uh, Russia and, and Belarus. Um, that is a long, an ongoing challenge, though, of independent journalists needing to understand that they have a safe place to do their work from, not just for six months or nine months or even a year, but to know that they can put down roots, that they and their families can stay in one place for five, 10 years, however long it takes. And that's something that I think needs a lot of focus because there's not agreement, even within the EU by national governments, that they're willing to extend those sorts of protections to journalists from Russia and Belarus. Uh, and the rules vary significantly. So that's a major challenge. Um, on the sources, you know, we, we try to mask our sources. Obviously, it's harder to talk to any sources. We're a foreign agent in Russia. We're an extremist in Belarus. 
Um, and so a lot of people just who used to do interviews with us will not do interviews anymore because it's a significant risk for them. And so we have to pursue the other ways of getting their comments um, by looking at something they posted online. Um, but we've had similar challenges, especially in Belarus, with even our audience being impacted. And we've had several reports of people having uh, their browser history searched on their cell phones and our website being discovered in their browser history and them getting seven to 10 day prison sentences as a warning basically for engaging with extremist content. And that's something that obviously we can't control uh, and uh, our audience has to understand that if they're engaging with our content, uh, it is a risk to them. We can set up secure messaging uh, for people to share tips and information, and we do that as much as possible. The interesting thing, though, uh, I was laughing with Lola's reference to a cell phone, because I think we've, our reporters have found the same thing, especially in Russia. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of people, even in the Russian military, who are willing to talk to journalists. A lot of them are actually putting out their grievances about the war on their own social media accounts. And so it often just takes an intrepid journalist who may be sitting couple hundred or several thousand miles away, uh, looking at Russian social media accounts, seeing someone who clearly had an interesting experience and sending them a direct message and saying, hey, you know, I'm from this news outlet, will you talk to me? And not all of them will, but we've had many investigative reports where uh, people were willing to talk to a journalist, partly because they were so angry about what was happening inside Russia and they wanted to share their perspective. Uh, and so again, that's all been enabled by technology but still you have to have a, a journalist who's willing to put in the time and effort to dig up that story. Mm. Is that your impression and feeling to uh, Sasha and Lola? There are a lot of people out there who want to talk to you and share their stories? Uh, in Belarus, no, <laughs> uh, because um, I think uh, we feel uh, that Belarus now, it's like uh, occupied territory. Uh, it's a total uh, silence. Uh, but now uh, some people want to uh, talk some information because uh, they don't see another way. And yes, we have experts who now live in Belarus, but uh, of course we talk anonymously with uh, them. Um, but I think it's uh, not like in Russia now. Maybe uh, in the next time, <laughs> Russia have, uh, will have a similar situation, but now uh, we have another situation. And we are uh, talking with experts who now uh, exile, uh, like uh, we, uh, more than peop uh, with people who now live in Belarus because it's really very dangerous. Mm. Uh, we didn't have, uh, we don't have a journalist in Belarus and it's mm, too difficult to find uh, new stories, for example. Uh, we're talking with our subscribers. Uh, the subscribers uh, give the information and after we doing uh, our investigation. Mm. It's not like a talking, not interview. It's only some topics for us. Yeah, we talked about the, the Press Freedom Index uh, earlier that was launched today. And um, Belarus is now number 157 of uh, 180 countries on that index. And you've fallen on the index only the last year. Um, mm -hmm. Can you say something about how you notice that press freedom is shrinking in your country? Uh, I think now in Belarus, um, only two edit editorial, independent editorial. <laughs> uh, and it's really uh, unbelievable because uh, in terroristic list uh, and extremistic list, uh, you may find uh, every independent media uh, from Belarus. Mm. Uh, yes, I think we don't have freedom of speech now in Belarus. 
and the way that uh, the authorities uh, are targeting uh, free media is to uh, stamp you as extremist organizations, right? And, and then um, your colleagues who are in jail now, they were um, also convicted for tax evasion, right? So is that a common practice as well? Yes. Um uh, who uh, work in Belarus now, uh, like um, Stringer, um, have um, big dangers for be in prison. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, some people now talk with uh, some Belarus independent TV or talking with independent media like Circula, uh, we may find this name uh, after in Vesna um, uh, topic on uh, a Telegram ch uh, channel, like um, political prisoners. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's very much the same story that we hear from um, Vesna, the organization of Alice uh, Bialyatsky, one of the Nobel laureates from last year. Uh, the same kind of um, legal uh, prosecutions that they face. Um, Lola, Russia uh, fell 10 places in, in the Press Freedom Index uh, this year. Uh, do you also notice the, the tightening of press freedom in your country? Yes, sure. Last year uh, it happened a lot. Just imagine the picture that uh, all links which you open inside the Russia are all media, first of all, uh, under control. Mm -hmm. No one independent media uh, is able to to publish something and uh, to don't be blocked. You, it's it's like you know, it's like uh, Alice in Wonderland. You travel in Russia, and uh, the the reality is changed. You open, you took your smartphone. You can't. You're not able. You live in totally clear. Uh, board and everything under censorship. That like you have, uh, you have um, access just to uh, just to uh, the Kremlin media. Even even Google, when you use this Google Discover, you know this in your smartphone. Yeah, you you can open just uh, the, the the Kremlin media, the media under censorship, uh, and you are working. You you live in this. Uh, absolutely um, different world. Mm. And even 1,000 journalists have left the country. Yes, and journalists are not able to work inside the Russia. Otherwise, because we are not able even to say the war. If you say the war and not special operation, you will go to the prison. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can't call uh, the real names, what's, <laughs> what's <laughs> the, the things what is, uh, which, which is going on. So. Uh, and, uh, but um, we have to remember and that when the war started, the beginning of the march, last independent media were destroyed. I mean, the Nova Gazette and TV right now, thanks God, uh, they started to work again in, uh, in another project, like Nova Gazette Europa and TV Rain, uh, restarted. But uh, now it's a media in exile. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what we can say, Russians are not able to have an access to independent information. Uh, who is able? Uh, the people who use the VPN, how you said before, and people who use the social media like Telegram channel and YouTube. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have to understand who is uh, our audience. Yes, uh, our audience is the people who has some doubts, who has uh, questions, who doesn't believe the propaganda, because if people, um, the audience who believe in propaganda, you can't make, you, I think you can't change a lot. But a lot of, uh, I think it's a pretty huge percentage of audience who has questions, who has doubts, who suffer and trying to find the information. And as worse, the situation became in Russia, economical, political, a war, uh, and, and other, uh, the, um, and other issues, the more people start to search the information, try to 
ask and to resend the links and messengers. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to find a way how to, how to provide the information, create the special links which they can open, uh, in, when special links, uh, special technologies, and trying to push the information inside. Yes, the war really changed the situation with the freedom, said the Russia. So how do you see Vertska's role in this war? The role? What is, what is your mission? Our mission is to make uh, great journalism. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I mean, when the war started, uh, the journalism has to start to work in 10 times more because we started to have more and more issues, more problems, more crimes. Uh, but at the same time, independent media were destroyed. So instead of to increase in 10 times um, the independent media inside the Russia, what we received, we received that, the, that we didn't have uh, a media. And it means that the that Verska and another independent media is not enough, still not enough. Because we have to answer, we have to, we have to answer for propaganda, we have to um, provide the true information. Mm. So, um, if, I mean, it, it, life became very hard for journalists in, in Russia and Belarus uh, after the war, and it could have been we could have faced a situation where a lot of uh, independent media gave up. What would, what would have happened to society then? I mean, if, if you were not there, how would, uh, how would it be for, for Russian and Belarusian consumers of the media? It's a good question. <laughs> First of all, I think we have to... Um, we have to remember that what we are doing is some kind of documentary about the historical time. Because mm. uh, I'm sure after, I don't know, several years, 10 years, uh, we will read in the books, in the, uh, in, in the lessons of a history, what happened in Russia, what happened in Ukraine, why the war um, happened uh, in the Europe, and who will write the truth? And uh, the truth will be written by every day's reports, every day's true information. I think there is our mission, first of all. I don't know if you agree or not. I think we're still with Belarusian audience. We can verify that more than 76% uh, it's uh, uh, viewers who now live in Belarus. Uh, and we uh, show the real picture of Belarus and show the war in Ukraine. And yes, uh, we now work in exile, but uh, we still focus on uh, Belarus. And okay, we work in exile, but um, our subscribers uh, and all of the um, experts uh, and professional uh, people uh, now talk with us. And I think it's not exile journalism uh, like journalists for diaspora. It's really journalism for Belarusian people. I would just say I, yeah. I see what's uh, what's happened, and especially with Russia, as a warning sign, um, lessons that we should learn for other countries. I think we've we've had this sense that um, propaganda maybe doesn't work, that it's you know it's hard, especially for Russians who grew up post ninety one. That of course they're not going to easily fall. Uh, you know, pray to state-sponsored propaganda. Putin has shown that's not the case. And we still do some reporting on the ground. We interview people on the street. We have videos which we post on our website of talking to a cross-section of Russian society. And it's not just 
elderly citizens who have bought into the Kremlin's narratives. It's uh, people whose entire lives have been post uh, the Soviet era, um, and they've also fallen for this. And some of that was because the Kremlin and Putin very methodically prepared for this moment over decades in slowly shrinking the space for independent views and perspectives. And so a lot of the things we're talking about didn't just start within the last 15 months. They got really acute within the last 15 months, but the legal framework, the foreign agent framework, uh, was laid years prior and w probably with the intent to eventually have complete control over the information space if it was needed uh, for stability purposes or for some sort of foreign adventure in, in Ukraine or elsewhere. Um, so I think that's why we need to be very careful about these declines in press freedom we're seeing across much of Eurasia in other countries where it appears to be very incremental and small, but it has almost shown a roadmap about how regimes who want to maintain their grip on power can slowly shrink the space uh, of independent media uh, and then finally ramp up the pressure and target journalists, shut them down, kick them out, control the internet. Um, we see website blocking increasing, by the way, across Eurasia, many countries, mm -hmm. um, which previously didn't seem to care about policing online content. That's a new trend. Uh, and so I think, unfortunately, this is now a roadmap for other authoritarians who want to exert complete control over their societies. It's a saying that uh, the truth is the first victim in a war, but maybe the truth uh, uh, becomes a victim uh, even before the war starts. Yes. As a precondition for, for war. Um, it's, um, it's really... Uh, strong stories that you have uh, and uh, I, I must say that uh, I think you, you're very brave to be here you're very brave to, to talk about it openly like this and it means a lot and as you said Sasha it's, that is about freedom of expression as well it's important to tell, to tell the stories um, I want to ask all, all three of you um, because you, you, you talked about your mission, your role, uh, but what is, what is your dream for, for Serkula, for oh. Vertska, and for Radio Free Europe? Can we start with you, Sasha? What, what, what is your goal with the work you're doing now? Uh, firstly, I want um, meet, uh, we will meet my colleagues, Marina and Ludmila. Yeah, that is the editor and uh, CEO director of, of Tutbai. Uh, Tutbai. Yeah. And they were uh, arrested in 2021, and they got their uh, verdict years. only a couple of months ago, right? Yes. And they both got 12 years in prison mm -hmm. for yes. being uh, members of an extremist organization and also tax evasion and, and terrorism. 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 Yes. Yes. Uh, I want... Uh, we'll meet Marina and Mila. Uh, yes, it's really my dream. Uh, and uh, I want to reopen to Dubai because it's very important for Belarusian people. Firstly, it's a good case for uh, media business, independent media business in the country. Um, and it's something about freedom of speech. Yeah, and I want to uh, come to Belarus. Yeah, so your, your goal is not to continue to run uh, Circula, but to, to reopen to Dubai. Reopen to Dubai, yes, mm. of course. Circula, it's uh, exile media. Uh, it's our solution for this time. Uh, but Belarus need uh, big media, uh, big resource, uh, innovation resource, mm. uh, with great journalists, with staff, more than uh, 300 people. Now we have near 56 people and focus on political and economics. But to buy it's more than uh, this media. Mm. What about you, Lola? Uh, do you hope to uh, to come back? Close down Vertska <laughs> or run it from, from from Russia? Yes, 
uh, of course, we have to come back. We have to come back uh, to work, uh, to make reports on, from the lands and uh, to try. You know, now the situation for for us, for another media, is like something um, we're trying to make journalism in a, in a, in a pretty uh, hard pressure. So, for example, we can't call to some, I don't know, someone from parliament or someone from government and ask a pretty normal journalist question, like, what do you think about it? Uh, what are you going to do? Are you going to make this or not? It's, but for us, it's impossible. We're not able to make just a normal, ordinary job. And yes, this is my dream, just to come back and to, to make our job uh, and stop to be so... <laughs> it's uh, our popular joke uh, between, between my colleagues that the Russian media is uh, one of the um, strong um, investigative uh, outlets. Because we had to train our muscles every day. They're trying to hide the information. We're trying to find the way how to open this information, how to find it, and how to publish it. We had to train a lot, a lot, a lot. We're pretty sometimes tired <laughs> to train our muscles, and we just want to call and ask uh, how you make the year in Europe. Yes, that you can call and ask your, uh, I don't know, senators or parliament or so, someone. That's what we want. We just want to make journalism normal again. <laughs> of course. I, I, what did you ask you, Jamie, if you could say something about what you, th how d what you think it means for, for journalism, press freedom as such, that uh, brave journalists like Sasha and, and Lola here are continuing their work from abroad, even if it's impossible to work inside their countries. How important is that? I mean, I think it's very important because we, we experienced in our first several decades that very type of journalism. I mean, that's exactly what we were doing when we were doing radio broadcasts mm. from Munich. And the role that Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty played uh, in the events of 1989, in the events of 91, was key. I mean, independent media done by those in exile provided a lifeline of independent information um, to publics who then decided to act on that information and bring about change within their, their countries. Um, it's why we're headquartered in the Czech Republic, uh, because Václav Havel uh, saw the power of our work, like Walenza talked about at the time in our role in Poland. Um, and so I think it's very likely that the exile independent media is gonna play a major role in the future of Belarus, the future of, of Russia. And I think our journalists would answer the question the same way that Lola and Sasha did. We have colleagues, we have two of our colleagues who are in prison in uh, Belarus, and we'd like to see them released. Another one of our colleagues in Russian-occupied Crimea who was detained before the full-scale uh, invasion. And then ultimately, we've talked a lot internally despite losing our bureaus. Um, our dream is to first reopen our bureaus in Minsk and Moscow. Uh, and ultimately then with us, I think, our goal all, always is to go out of business. So we ideally don't want to have to be doing work in Russian and Belarusian, and we will leave it to uh, brave individuals like uh, Sasha and Lola and their teams in a, hopefully an environment where they can do normal journalism and mm -hmm. uh, we can, we're can we not really needed to play a role in supporting the spread of independent information. So I think that remains our long-term uh, goal. And how can, how can we, the international community, help you lose your job and, and help you <laughs> go back uh, to your countries and, and help uh, freeing those journalists, who are more than 300 journalists who are in jail uh, across the world? What can we do to support? Who wants to go? Um, firstly, it's a legalization. Uh, for example, Lithuania uh, was very hosting, hosting, very hosting for Belarusian independent media. Mm. Uh, and when we 
after war starting uh, went to Lithuania and Poland, we have very big support from uh, government. Um, and of course, after we lost our business model uh, in Belarus, uh, now we need uh, uh, financial support and international foundation support us. Uh, it's yeah, one hundred percent for us now because we have extremist status, and advertiser from Belarus can't working with us. Um, we have uh, donation from our readers, but not from Belarus because uh, it's uh, like a support of extremism. Of course, when I mean, <laughs> when when you are uh, customers. When it's illegal to be a customer, it's not easy to, to earn money. Yeah, uh, and we have a big uh, staff for exile independent media. And I think uh, it's n very big support from some foundation countries for support us mm -hmm. uh, now. Um, I can say that, uh, first of all, that, uh, understanding the situation, uh, that, uh, understanding what's going on with the Russian media uh, will really support. When, when we understand that, that the, our colleagues or, I don't know, European citizens uh, believe that, that <coughs> independent Russian media exists, that not just the Kremlin propaganda, that we do our job in a proper way, and uh, it's important for us, and thank you that you invited us, and thank you for this great audience. Um, and uh, understanding means even that uh, what Sasha said, that, that, that uh, we can't work in a, in, a, in a previous way when we had a, a working business model and when we had uh, um, possibilities to um, to increase uh, the audience uh, and to find ads and something like this. So uh, it's important and uh, what impor what's important too, I, I think it's to sometimes to write the truth, what's going on, and sometimes to write about uh, people who, about the journalists who are in the prisons, about activists who are in the prisons, that mm -hmm. they make them don't feel that they're so lonely. Mm -hmm. And they have uh, support from the world. Yeah, so if you can support a press organization and uh, share the stories that you've heard today, don't share the stories that are False. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what else can we do? Well, I think in, in other countries, um, I, I don't think the, at this point, well, it's still worth criticizing, it's worth sanctioning, but let's be honest, Putin and Lukashenko, I don't think care very much about what the rest of the world thinks of them at this point. But there are many other governments that do where they're also cracking down on journalists and they're taking those early steps to close the space for independent media, and so I think it's important that governments that care about that um, raise those issues. I spend a lot of my time sitting across from those government officials who are in the process of targeting our journalists and others, and I know that they, they do not want to be criticized. They do not want countries speaking out about these issues, and so I think um, that's important. And then another thing I just highlight on technology, which uh, we're looking into, and I think it's an area maybe for U.S.-European cooperation, in 2023, why is it that governments like the Lukashenko regime or the Putin regime have control over the internet in their countries? I mean, during the Cold War, we were able to broadcast into everyone's house over shortwave. Mm. Um, satellite internet technology is advancing so rapidly. There are private initiatives, Starlink and others, where you can do broadband internet, in some cases now almost direct to cell phones. I think in the next five to 10 years, there's gonna be a potential in Belarus to make free internet available to all Belarusians who have a smartphone. Um, I think that's an initiative that governments like the US and Europeans should work together on <laughs> and make that information, that access freely available. There's plenty of independent information that can then be accessed 
on the ground because right now Belarusians cannot go on the internet without fear of being monitored, of being blocked, of going to prison for engaging with certain types of content. Um, but there's, in the near term, a potential to reach them directly with independent information. And so I think there needs to be more technical cooperation in that realm uh, to make independent information available in, in these closed societies. Thank you. Uh, I want to just remind everybody of something you just said about uh, not taking press freedom for granted. Uh, and that is a good reminder for today on Press Freedom Day to remember that press freedom is uh, something we have to uh, appreciate. Even living in, in Norway, which ranks as number one on the Press Freedom Index, we need to be aware of that. I want to thank you so much for sharing your stories and your thoughts uh, on this issue. Uh, Sasha Pushkina, Lola Tagayeva, and uh, Jamie Fly. Thank you for being here with us today. Give them a big applause. And now I want to welcome on stage uh, the Czech ambassador, David Sevenka, for your final and closing remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was very, very sad. Very sad. Very sad. Very brave. Let me start by thanking the panel for an extremely interesting debate and your stories that you brought to Oslo. I have been closely following the state of the media freedom over the last decade. And unfortunately, much too of the time, we saw decline in many countries around the world. And as we just heard today, it was definitely true for Belarus and Russia, a country that has invaded its neighbor, Ukraine, a regime that suppresses its own civil society. Media outlets have been pushed away Independent journalists fear for their lives or were forced to leave for exile. But what is important, and I would stress that, is that we have brave journalists like Lola and Sasha that still find the courage to continue their work for the benefit of your own societies and for our own, for us in the world to understand what's happening in those countries. As a child growing up behind the Iron Curtain, and Jamie Fly has, has mentioned the case, it's my case, I vividly recall how much the Czech people benefited from RFERL broadcasting during the Soviet occupation. I would therefore like to stress the plea that we just heard at the end, that we as a family of democratic nations, be it through international organizations we're part of, uh, be it through like-minded formats like uh, Media Freedom Coalition or nationally, can and indeed should do to help independent media in countries like Russia and Belarus. It is possible and it's badly needed in these times. It is symbolic that Secretary Blinken and Minister Lipovsky reconfirmed a shared commitment for media freedom support to independent journalists in a joint statement yesterday. As they in Washington, we here today, Ambassador Mark Nathanson and, and I, are proud to work within a broad uh, coalition of friends to advance media freedom. I would like to thank our Norwegian partner, the Nobel Peace Center, and to you personally, Ingvil, and your colleagues for making this great event happen. Thank you for participating in our event here, here at Dombus Biblioteca. Thank you to people watching us online. I would like to invite you all for coffee and, and, and conversation with our panelists to mark today's World Press Freedom Day and continue our debate on a very important topic, freedom of the media. Thank you once again. <laughs>